Alexandra Boltaseva, professor of EC here at Purdue. And it gives me this distinct honor to actually uh, start out this uh, highly non-classical event today, well, to say the least, because it's, well, first of all, it's outside the semester um, hours, and I see so many of you here. Um, so it's, it's really great, and I wanted to start with some introductory statement. So Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series started a, back in 2018, and it always brings the most distinct world-renowned scientists, engineers, and professionals here on campus to engage in some thought-provoking discussions and share ideas with faculty and students. We usually run a lecture followed by interactive panel discussion, and that's what we are going to do today. And uh, with this said, I will invite our Dean of Engineering, um, Arvin Ramon, to the stage to introduce our distinguished speaker. Good, good afternoon and uh, a warm welcome to all of you present here today in person and to the many that are watching this event being streamed uh, online. Welcome to all of you to this special edition of the Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. Now it is my honor uh, to introduce today's distinguished lecturer, Professor Alain Aspe, distinguished professor at the Institut d'Optique at the University of Paris-Saclay and a true pioneer in the field of quantum mechanics. His experiments in the early 1980s with colleagues demonstrated comprehensively the phenomenon of quantum entanglement of photons and the violation of Bell's inequalities, an achievement for which he was recognized in 2022 with a Nobel Prize in Physics, which he shared with John Clauser and Anton Zeilinger. Dr. Aspe is really well known and recognized in many, many other um, distinctions. He is the recipient of the Wolf Prize. He is the recipient of the Commander Légion d'Honneur in France. He is the recipient of the Niels Bohr, UNESCO's Niels Bohr Prize and the CNRS Gold Award, Gold Prize, Gold Medal as well. Now, without further ado, please, joining, please join me in providing a great warm welcome to Professor Aspect. It's my fault, okay? I I wanted to rehearse, so I, it was working. I hope it will work again, that it is not too probabilistic. Okay. Mm, it will work. You will see. Don't panic. Ah, oh, it works. Okay. So thank you for this uh, nice introduction. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I must say it's the first time I am here, and uh, I am impressed by, what should I say, quality of the environment and quality of what I see here, the equipment, the buildings. Well, it's certainly an immense pleasure to work here, right? Uh, let me finish my... I, and a so-called laser pointer, of course, as it should. So now I have, you see it? You see the red pointer? Yes, okay. So I'm going to talk, obviously, of uh, Bell's inequality, but also uh, how it goes to nowadays all this excitement about uh, quantum technologies. I call it entanglement in action. So these new quantum technologies, how did they emerge? It was first a discussion between Einstein and Bohr in 1935 and Schrodinger adding his grain of salt. And the paper by Schrodinger is very interesting because it starts by saying 
There was this paper by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. I'm going to write about it and don't expect that I will clarify the situation. I will even put more mess in the situation. He says it better than me, but it's exactly the meaning of his words. So the conclusion at that time of Schrodinger is entanglement is amazing. Then it took another 30 years until Bell uh, found a way, demonstrated that entanglement is different, different from everything else people had known about quantum physics, and I will tell you more about that. And then another almost 20 years until Feynman, in contrast to what he writes in lectures in physics, in lectures in physics, which it's a lecture by the end of the 50s, he said, EPR, well, the same as uh, particles in slits. And 20 years later, he writes a paper uh, saying, mm, oops, uh, maybe there is something different. And Feynman being Feynman, as soon as he recognizes that there is something different, he invents a way to use it. And it was the first ideas about quantum computing. OK. So entanglement is at the root of many quantum technologies, and I will emphasize the fact that these quantum technologies are also permitted by the experimental progress in observing and controlling individual quantum objects. Let us start. And well, to finish, I will ask the question and try to answer do we have a new quantum revolution? Can we speak of a second quantum revolution? OK, let us try with the einstein podolsky rosen bohm gedanken experiment. Uh, and uh, first, what was Einstein's problem with quantum physics? What was Einstein's question? He was unhappy with the probabilistic nature of the mathematical predictions made by quantum physics. It's not to say that Einstein did not like probabilities. Most of you, I'm sure, know that one of his most excellent paper in 1905, which is a wonderful uh, year, one of his most fantastic paper is the one about Brownian motion. Uh, so he, he had no problem with probability, obviously. He understood it well. but. He thought that probability is a convenient tool. For instance, if I want to describe the uh, distribution of particles in this room, I will use probability to say the fraction of particles with, of, uh, let's say, molecule of uh, uh, azote of uh, nitrogen, you say, a molecule of nitrogen, the fraction of molecule of nitrogen with velocity between 300 and 310 meter per second is 5%. But we have no doubt that each molecule has its own trajectory, bounces on another one, etc. And so Einstein thought that the fundamental theory should describe things individually, and that probability is a convenient tool, but it's not the ultimate state of affairs. And so he starts discussing with Niels Bohr, and there was a first uh, big discussion at the fam famous discussion at the Solvay meeting of 1927. And uh, Einstein came with experiments, Gedanke, not experiments, Gedanke and experiments, thought experiments. That is to say, you imagine situation, and according to the known laws of physics, this is what you should observe. And he tried to show that when you have a single particle, you could measure velocity and position better than allowed by the mathematical formalism of physics. And if he had been right, it would have shown that there is indeed something below. But each time, Bohr could come with a good argument saying, no, you forget this, you make a mistake here, etc. So Bohr really each time could rebut this uh, attack. It was only about a single particle. Can I measure velocity and position of a single particle? In 1935, he came with an other attack to the fact that you cannot go beyond a certain level of accuracy. And it used 
two particles and two entangled particles. It discovered entanglement, so to speak. And this is what we are going to talk about now. So I will present you entanglement uh, in the form of the experiment most of us have been doing. Most of us, I mean the people who have seriously tested belts inequality. You have two photons, a photon going to the left, a photon going to the right, and you merge polarization on it. Most of you mean what it means to measure polarization. An optical wave is an electromagnetic wave. When it propagates, you have the electric field vibrating perpendicular to the propagation. If you put a polarizer along this direction of polarization, the beam will go up. If now the polarization is like that, the beam will go down. If it is in between, a part of the beam will go up, a part of the beam will go down. But if you have a single photon, you will not have a part of the photon going up and a part of the photon going down. You will have either the photon going up or the photon going down. And what quantum mechanics allows you to calculate is what is the probability to get a photon up, what is the probability to get a photon down. That's the idea of the quantum probability. <clears throat> so we measure the polarization along a direction A with this polarizer, and we measure single probability to go up or to go down when the orientation is A, and similarly on that side. And then we measure joint probability. What is it? What is the probability to get plus one here and plus one here? Or the probability to get plus one here and minus one here with orientation A and B. Up to now, I just described an experiment. There is not yet the entanglement. Entanglement comes when you recognize that the mathematical formalism of quantum mechanics allows you to think of such a state. What is it? Even those of you who don't understand the notation, you will learn something from me now. You will learn that Dirac formalism, this bracket, as he's called it, is absolutely fantastic. XX just means a pair of photons each polarized along X. First photon polarized along X, second photon polarized along X. You see, vertical axis. Y, Y is two photons like that, okay? Polarized along Y. What Einstein and his colleagues recognized is that if XX does exist, if Y, Y does exist, you can also consider a pair of photons in this superposition of XX and Y, Y. And don't think that this is a simple situation. It's certainly not two photons like that, because if it was two photons like that, you could write the state as a product of one photon in this and one photon in that. And there is no way to do it. People who know a little bit of mathematics, you will easily find that you cannot factorize that. So in the, for this state, you cannot say, my first photon is like that and my second is like that. It's both this and that. And uh, I am only slightly exaggerating if I tell you that it is as surprising as the Schrodinger cat, which is both dead and alive. Of course, here you have only two particles in a cat. There is more than two particles. But from the point of view of the formalism, it's absolutely uh, new and different from everything, anything we knew. Once you have this state, you can calculate the quantum probability, the probability predicted by the formalism for getting plus one, minus one, and for joint probability. For plus one and minus one, it's simple. You find one half, which means that it is totally random. You look here, you can as well as have plus one or minus one, just to see, like tossing a coin. If you look on the other side, it's the same, you have one half. So it's just like tossing a coin, you have plus one, plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one. But when you look at two things, then the joint probability is not random, it has some dependence. And uh, if you consider, for instance, the case where the two polarizers are along the same direction, so the angle AB is zero, you find that P plus plus equals P minus minus equal one half. And I claim that this is a full correlation. 
And you are going to tell me, come on, one half is not full correlation. Yes, it's full correlation because look, the probability to get plus one here is one half. And the probability to get plus one and plus one is also one half, which means that the conditional probability to get plus one here, once you have got one half here, this conditional probability is 100%. In other words, here you may have plus one or minus one, but if you get plus one, you are sure to get plus one. If you get minus one, you are sure to get minus one, and if you are not yet convinced, the crossed probability are zero. No probability to get plus one here and minus one here. Okay, so we have full correlation. So we need to express correlation by a coefficient of correlation, which is a classical definition in probability, which is for expert, the average of the product minus the product of the average, but because we have values plus one and minus one, at the end of the day, this expression. And if you take into account this quantum calculation, this is a value of the coefficient of correlation. And look, if the angle is zero, the coefficient of correlation is one. So it means that our formalism is consistent. Okay, at this point, you have two attitudes. One attitude, which is the most frequent with people doing quantum physics, is okay, I have the result of a calculation and I am happy with it. That's called shut up and calculate. It's well known. And there is another attitude. I am a naive physicist, and when I have the result of a calculation, I like to have an image to try to understand the phenomena. And so, I try to understand how do I get this strong correlation, because you know this correlation is strange. You have a guy throwing a coin, a guy throwing a coin, and when you look from far, you see, oh, when he has heads, he has heads. When he has tails, he has tails. Well, that's really strange. So I want to understand where it comes from. And I look into the calculation, and if I look into the most efficient way of doing the calculation, I cannot make any image. Why? Because this state, xx plus yy, is in an abstract space, which is a Hilbert space, which is a tensor product of the space describing the first particle by the space describing the other one. I don't know how to make an image in now space, okay? Impossible to extract an image in ordinary space where the two photons are separated. I should emphasize the fact that the big discovery of Anshan, Polosky and Rosen is that entanglement can be thought of even at large distance. And so you have the thing separated and you would like to, come to understand where does this correlation comes from. You cannot do it in the abstract space, but on the other hand, as Asher Perez, a famous theorist in quantum optics, say, uh, quantum phenomena do not occur in a Hilbert space. They occur in a laboratory. I have a laboratory, I have a source here, six meter one polarizer, six meter another polarizer. I want an image in my laboratory. And in fact, there is a way to find an image by doing the calculation a little more complicated. I will suppose that the measurement on the first photon happens first. So now I am in my space, there is a measurement here, I can find either plus one or minus one. We have seen that it is a result of the calculation. And now what do I do? I go to my Bible, my personal Bible is the Kohen Tanuji book, some of you have studied in the Kohen Tanuji book, I go in the Bible and they tell me after a measurement the state is changed into a new state which is a projection of the initial state onto the space associated with the result. So I do that, I project onto the state of the first result and what I get you think they are coming late? <laughs> Maybe I start again, okay, for then. So after that projection, that state becomes this. And this is quite clear. It's two photons like that. So you see what I add. Measurement can give either plus one or minus one. I find plus one corresponding to that, and then now the two photons are like that. But if I had found that, then the two photons would be like that. And so you see, obviously, 
that when I do the measurement on the other side, it's not a surprise to find the same result as on the first side. Okay? So now I have an image to understand this strong correlation. But there is a problem which was annoying Einstein very much. The measurement on the first particle seems to influence instantaneously at a distance the state of the other one. This could not be accepted by Einstein, who, you remember, was the inventor or discoverer of relativity. In relativity, nothing can be instantaneous. So what do you do with that? Well, you come to the conclusion that of Einstein. This is so strange that there is a solution out of it. It's to suppose that you have to complete quantum mechanics. Once again, he comes back to the, his idea. You have to complete quantum mechanics. So the idea would be the following. This is beyond what Einstein said. Einstein said it's not complete. So people like John Bell have tried to complete it. So the idea is the following. When the two photons are emitted, from the beginning, they have a joint property that will decide that both will go up. Maybe for the next pair, the, it will decide that both will go down, etc. And you try to reproduce a correlation with a model in which each photon has its probability. And of course, when you average over all the possibility, you recover the prediction. They insist. Huh? Yeah. You recover uh, uh, all the prediction of quantum mechanics. And I want to emphasize that this image is very scientific. It's an image convincing. Before they knew, before we knew how to, to decipher the chromosomes, medical doctor had already concluded that when two twin brothers or two twin sisters share the same disease, for instance, it means that there is a common chromosome uh, that decide that these diseases will be taken by one of the other one. So this kind of reasoning is absolutely scientific, okay? And uh, so this, this supplementary parameter is called a hidden variable. Bohr immediately disagreed with the conclusion of Einstein, Polotsky, and Rosen in saying if you try to complete quantum mechanics, it will fall apart. But I must say that in contrast to the reasoning of 1927, which were impeccable reasoning, the reply of Bohr to Einstein in 1935 is more philosophy than scientific demonstration. Basically, it says you are not allowed to speak of what you don't measure, etc. But this is not always true. At the end of the 19th century, there were people saying, you are not allowed to speak about uh, atoms because you don't see them. And there was Boltzmann with his one, and Maxwell with a wonderful. So the argument, you are not allowed to speak of what you don't observe, it's a matter of faith. It's not a, a matter of scientific demonstration. And so Bohr say, you are not allowed, but some people say, we don't care. Let us investigate the consequence. And it took almost 30 years until John Bell demonstrated this unbelievable theorem, no local hidden variable theory, so no description of the world in the spirit of Einstein's idea, can reproduce quantum mechanical prediction for EPR correlations. Okay, so this is John Bell in front of a blackboard with a scheme of an experiment which was my experiment. This is why I'm so happy that they have this photo is everywhere on the web, but I know that it is my experiment, you know. So basically, the formalism that Bell uses is quite simple. He says, let us suppose we have the pair of photons characterized by a parameter lambda. Once I know lambda, I know what will happen at polarizer number one. I will get either plus one or minus one, depending on the value of this function. We can have only two values. Same on the second uh, polarizer. And then, of course, I have many different lambda for the various pairs. And I have a probability distribution, rho of lambda. And with this, I can calculate everything I want, and in particular, the famous correlation coefficient, which is nothing else than the average of the product AB, average over rho of lambda. Okay, quite simple. 
I'm not going to do the demonstration, but if you ask me at the end, I will show you it's less than five minutes to do the demonstration. With this, Bell could demonstrate that for any model following that scheme, not a specific A, not a specific row, any A, B, and row, he could demonstrate that there is a quantity called S, which cannot be B, bigger than two, cannot be less than minus two, and this quantity involves four coefficients of correlation with two orientation on one side, A or A prime, and two orientation on the other side, B of B prime. Of course, there is something strange with the sign, okay, three plus and one minus, why? Well, it's just like asking why Bell was a genius. He had the good idea. Maybe he tried several, and at the end he found that. So, if you consider this, and if you can calculate that introducing supplementary parameters, then S cannot be bigger than two. Once again, ask and I will show you. On the other hand, you remember quantum mechanics with a correlation coefficient equal to that. Now, small exercise. Let us consider this set of orientation where this is pi over eight. Two times pi over eight is pi over four. Everybody follows at this point, okay? A little more difficult. Cosine of pi over four is, I don't ask you, Chris, one over root two. You are not allowed to say one over root two. So now you have one over root two, one over root two, one over root two. Now the most difficult part, A, B prime, you double the angle and the cosine is negative. It's minus one over root two, but you have a minus. It's another one over root two. And the result is that for these angles, S is equal to two root two, which is much bigger than two. So if you have hidden variable, local hidden variable, you cannot be bigger than two. But if quantum mechanics is correct, you have more than two. So now, you can discriminate between things which sounded to be just philosophy, epistemology. Now you can do an experiment to decide who is right. If you find quantum me mechanics, Bohr is right. If you find less than two, then Einstein is right. Okay. Before embarking into experiment, let us look in more details into Bell's formalism. And people, Bell himself, from the beginning said, in order to be able to derive Bell's inequality, you need to assume that the result of the measurement here does not depend on the orientation of the other polarizer, which is here. So not allowed to depend on B. Similarly, the result of measurement here cannot depend on the orientation of the other one, and also, the way in which pairs are emitted, the distribution of the lambda, is not allowed to depend on the orientation of the polarizers. And this is why Bell say at the conclusion of his paper, this can be stated as a reasonable hypothesis. Usually we think that the result here does not depend on the other there. But we are talking maybe of unknown interaction and stuff like that. And so rather than taking as a reasonable uh, uh, hypothesis, let us try to have it derived from a fundamental law of physics, and the fundamental law of physics is Einstein relativistic causality. That is to say, if I could change the orientation of the polarizers while the photon are in flight, then the result here cannot depend on the orientation of the other Y here because I change it at the last moment and there is no time for a signal to come and say now it was a different information. And more obviously, when the photons are emitted, if you change the orientation of the polarizer while the photons are in flight, then obviously it cannot depend on the orientation that it will take later. So this was the idea which uh, um, impressed me very much when I read the paper of Bell and I decided that I wanted to do an experiment where one changes the orientation like that. Okay. So, in an experiment with variable polarizer, we would have a full conflict between quantum mechanics and Einstein's worldview, which is you have to complete quantum mechanics and nothing can go faster than light. Okay. 
There were many experiments. Well, at the beginning, not so many. There was, uh, I would, I, I like to say, three generations of experiment. There were the pioneers in '72. John Clauser and Stuart Friedman at Berkeley did a wonderful experiment. They found quantum mechanics. At the same time, in Harvard, Holt and Pipkin did an experiment and did not find quantum mechanics. They found the Bell's inequality. It was exciting. Then Klaus repeated the experiment of Pipkin and found quantum mechanics. And finally, for this first series, Fry in Texas A&M, agriculture and mining. So why quantum? Who knows? Anyway, Fry did a beautiful experiment, and the trend was in favor of quantum mechanics. Anyway, if I was showing you the scheme of this experiment, you would not recognize the scheme that I have known. It was more indirect than what I have shown you. And this is why I started in saying, I'm going to do an experiment with a scheme which is exactly the same scheme as the one on which we discuss. And moreover, I want to change the orientation of the polarizers. So these were the experiments. I embarked into this in 1975, and the final result came in 82. It was my PhD. It was a long PhD. Okay. Yes, but it was worth it. Okay. <laughs> and then starting at the end, uh, the st starting 10 years later, let's to say, there was a third generation of experiments uh, done in, uh, in Rochester in many places. And, not as, and then Anton Zeilinger in uh, Innsbruck, he was in Innsbruck at that time, and then a series of places where you have better and better experiment, okay? And uh, experiment with new source of entangled pairs, closer of the last loopholes, entangled mat at very large distance. I will show you a few of that. I don't resist because they gave me a little more time than pre pre predicted at the beginning, on that uh, they said at the beginning. I cannot resist showing you my source of entangled pair of photon, which was much better than the source of Clauser. And it was a key to be able to go beyond, okay? It, it, they were not stupid. They did the best with what they had. The idea is the following. If you can excite a calcium atom into this level, then the atom has no choice. It decay going through this state and down to this state. And if you look at the degeneracy of the levels, you go from here, pass here, and go down, or another way. And in quantum mechanics, when you have two possible paths, and when you cannot distinguish between the paths, you must add the amplitudes. And by adding the amplitude, you can easily demonstrate that you get the pair of photons entangled in polarization. Clauser was using this source, but he had a problem. He could not excite directly that state because of parity, equation of parity conservation. And so he had to excite an upper state, and from there, from time to time, the atom would nicely decay here, but very often it would go to another path, come here, give the second photon without the twin brother, etc. And so what I could do because of development of laser and because of the invention of something new which was called two-photon absorption, I was able to directly excite the atoms here. And with this, then I had only the good pairs of entangled photon and I had a signal to noise ratio fantastic just to give an idea and impress you. And at the beginning, you are not going to be impressed, but I will tell you why you should be impressed. I got a hundred coincidence, a hundred joint detection per second. You are going to tell me, well, hundred, that's not much. Yes, because in this kind of experiment, there is absolutely no noise. So the only uncertainty is a statistical fluctuation. And so with 100 counts, statistical fluctuation, which is root of 100, is 10. So it's 10%. But if you wait for 100 seconds, then you have 10 to the fourth count. And the root of uh, 10 to the fourth is 100. And now the statistical accuracy is 1%. So in only 
100 seconds, less than two minutes, I had the signal to noise ratio as good as Clouser for hours and hours. And when you can operate fast, of course, there are plenty of advantage. So we first repeated the experiment of Clouser and found without any discussion quantum mechanics. And then for the first time, we did a scheme like that in which we had the two output of the polarizer. In previous experiment, it was just like Polaroid. A Polaroid transmits one polarization and block the orthogonal one. And so in order to find what would be the minus result if you had the minus channel, you compare with polarizer in, polarizer out, etc. It's a complication. It's not good. Just, well, it's not good. They did a beautiful experiment with it, but it's much better to do that. And by doing that, uh, just for people who have an idea of what is experimental physics, what is fantastic here, fantastic here that you do not need any auxiliary calibration. You select a pair of orientation, A, B. You measure the four rates, plus, 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 minus, minus, plus, and minus, minus, and you have these four numbers, you just calculate this ratio, and that's it. It's self-calibrating by the sum of the firm number. This, and this is really fantastic. Look at the result. We plot the quantity S of Bell as a function of the angle. And we see that it varies like that. The green curve is the curve that we calculate with quantum mechanics, taking into account the small inefficiency of the experiment. And you see that the result comes beautifully on that curve, okay? And we violate Bell's inequality by more than 40 standard deviation. You have to know that in big accelerators, like in CERN or other places, when they have a bump over a background, which you can distinguish from the background by three standard deviation, they leak the information that maybe they are observing something. And when they have five standard deviations, they publish, okay? Here, 40 standard deviations, so no discussion. Okay. Now, I told you from the beginning I wanted to switch the polarizer. But look, the polarizer is a cube here, but I have here a photomultiplier, here another photomultiplier, which is a tube in a series of shielding, including shielding lead, because you have cosmic rays arriving on the ceiling. You don't believe it, there are cosmic rays arriving here, okay? And this cosmic ray will give spurious uh, results, etc. So the big shielding, the result is... Uh, is, uh, how would you say in this country? 100, 100 pounds, okay? I would, say, I would say 50 kilograms, okay? But you are not going to rotate uh, such a polarizer in, in just uh, a few nanoseconds. So my idea from the beginning, and I published it at the beginning, was to say, look, if I could build a switch here, which either let light go straight or diffract light toward this direction, if I put a first polarizer in orientation A and another polarizer in orientation A prime, if my switch is fast enough, this is equivalent to a single polarizer switch from A to A prime, back to A, back to A prime. Same thing on the other side, do the test. This complicates the experiment, so rather than having 1% in uh, two minutes, I had 1% in uh, 15 minutes, I think I remember something like that. Anyway, we got, so the, ah, yes, an interesting thing. I order a switch. I had the idea of the switch. I went to a company and said, can you build that? Yes, we can. But they couldn't. And so, what do you do when you are a researcher? You begin to think. Uh, they, their problem, uh, yeah, I am okay with time. It's an interesting story for students. Um, the, 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 the problem was that, uh, we use uh, uh, acoustic wave in a crystal, and for that, they stick transducer on the side of the crystal. And to stick, they have to heat everything, and the dilation coefficients are different, so it broke any time. And so I began to read the books of, I, I didn't know anything about acousto-optic interaction, so I began to read the books, 
And I discovered in the book, I did not discover myself, I discovered, printed in the book, that the water was a good enough acousto-optic medium for what I wanted to do. And then the problem of sticking is no longer there. You just take a, a small recipient, you put the two transducer, and that is. And so this is what we built, okay? So we built ourselves, our system, and it worked. And so it was a difficult experiment, but anyway, we found a convincing result. We found a violation of Bell's inequality by six standard deviation, and for the first time, each measurement was space-like separated, it's a word of relativity, from the setting of the distant polarizer, which means that the result here could not depend on the orientation of the other size unless you accept that something goes faster than light. Okay. There have been a beautiful new generation of experiments starting in the late 80s, but it took until 1998 for they break our record of the 40 standard deviation, etc., which means that it was difficult. But once this source was working, it was wonderful. It was nonlinear optics, so you can, uh, many of you here can appreciate. And the beauty of it is that in nonlinear optics, you have a phase matching condition which imposes the direction of emission of the photon. Well, in my case, the photons were emitted in all directions in space, so you need to have lenses, collect everything. Here, you impose the direction of emission of the photon, and it's concentrated enough that you can fit the photon into an optical fiber. And once you have them in an optical fiber, you can go at hundreds of meters or even kilometers. So here, for instance, Nicolas Gisin in Geneva in 98 could make an experiment in which he puts his source in Geneva, makes a measurement at Bellevue, which is four or five kilometers from Geneva, put the other one at 10 kilometers from Geneva, and Tangelman was still here. Zeilinger in uh, Innsbruck put his, uh, at the 200 meters here and 200 meters here, and Zeilinger went one step further than me in the fact that he decided to switch the orientation of the polarizer, but rather than doing it like me, periodically, like a crazy, that's all I could do. I knew that I would have liked to do the experiment, but I could not. So I was switching like a crazy. Zeilinger had enough time to throw a dice and decide from throwing a dice which direction. Of course, it was not a real dice. It was a random number generator, but there was enough time to operate a random number generator and decide randomly of the orientation. He still got uh, quantum physics and violation of Bell's inequality. And I can share with you something personal. It was the first time that somebody was repeating my experiment. And until that time, sometime, at night, I would have a nightmare that maybe I had made something wrong and I had announced the wrong result. So when they call me from Innsbruck and say, we repeated your experiment and we find the same thing as you, I say, since that time, I, I, I sleep better. Then there is a full series of other experiments, closing loopholes, etc. I don't want to go into details. If you want to know more, uh, when the so-called um, loophole-free experiments were published in 2015, I wrote a news and views, but I did not give it to Nature because I had some argument with them. If you ask me in private, I will tell you. And uh, so I gave my news and views to this Journal of the American Physical Society, which is free, which is online, and uh, really I've made a lot of efforts to make this paper as clear as possible about my evaluation of this loophole-free test of Bell's inequality. Okay, let us go to the conclusion. The conclusion is whatever you do, if you do it well, you find a violation of Bell's inequality, which means that Einstein's worldview, Einstein's local realism is untenable. 
you have to do something. You have a new image of the world. Uh, you, you, you have to take that into account. And it cannot be the same image as Einstein's. I will comment a little bit of that. The failure of local realism. What should we conclude from the failure of local realism? Well, just read Einstein. What? Einstein said that a fa local realism was not true? No, Einstein was making a reasoning ad absurdum. He said, if I was not right, this is what you would have to accept. But we know that we have to accept. So just read Einstein. So this text of Einstein, really, it's written both in English and in German in a book which is called Einstein, Philosopher Scientists, written in 55. So these are sentences by Einstein himself. Either drop, and I will comment after that, either drop the need of the independence of the physical reality present in different parts of space, or accept that the measurement on one system changes instantaneously the real situation of the other one. So what does it mean by the real situation, by the physical reality? It means that's really Einstein's view on the world. If I have a system here which is enclosed in a volume in space-time, you have in this volume all the parameters necessary to know any quantity, energy, angular momentum, whatever you can think, momentum, etc. Okay? And in addition, you have everything for calculating the future evolution. So that's the natural idea that we have when we do physics. Okay? If we know all the parameters here, we know everything. Okay. Well, so this is the physical reality. The point is the first option that we have to, uh, to renounce is to say, well, when I have two objects, the property of the ensemble is not only the addition of this parameter and of that parameter. There is something else in the combined object, this is entanglement. There is more in the two uh, object together than in the sum of the parameter of one or the other one. Another way, that's another sentence of Einstein, is to say, now I cannot consider the two things are independent. If I change something here, immediately it changes something here. That's another vision of renouncing Einstein local realism. We have coined two words for that. The first word is quantum Holism. Quantum holism may tell us the composed object is a whole. We are not allowed to separate it in two parts. Okay? And it's very important to think about that because it's a key for quantum computing. I can tell you a little more later. If I take the other point of view, that when I do something here, it changes there, we call it quantum non-locality, and this has given applications which are quantum communication. Okay. So, uh, well, even if you have quantum non-locality, and I think that we have quantum uh, non-locality, you cannot use it for a, uh, a telegraph going faster than light. Ask me a question at the end, I will explain you that. Okay. So this is a situation. We have the failure of re local realism. For my personal uh, uh, CV, what I decided to do after that is to work on something else. Claude Cohen Energy asked me to join his group for starting laser cooling of atoms, and I totally forgot about that story. And uh, a few years later, smart people discovered that you can use entanglement to do beautiful application. And most of them are using quantum non-locality, so I'm going to show you how quantum non-locality, which is a concept that I like, and many physicists say, well, this is nonsense, so shut up and calculate, and you don't have a non-locality, but I have non-locality in my images, and what I want to show you is that non-locality gives me fruitful intuition. And once 
quantum non-locality has shown me something interesting, then I do the full calculation, I shut up, I do the calculation, and I check that my intuition is supported by the calculation. So the most, the, 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 the clearest example that I can give is quantum cryptography. I explain you the problem. You have two friends, you recognize them. Eh? Of course, this is Alice and this is Bob. They are friends, they want to communicate, and there is a spy here, an eavesdropper, you know? And to be sure that he's a bad guy, I put a mustache on him, so I'm sure, I'm sure it's clearly a, a bad guy, okay? Now, they want to communicate secretly, they don't want to have the spy discovering the message. And Robert Shannon, the father of the theory of information, demonstrated a theorem which has nothing to do with quantum, which is, if Alice encodes with a random series of one and zero, and if Bob decodes with the same series of one and zero, it's called a one-time pad, then Eve cannot decipher the message, but there is one condition. The message should not be longer than the encoding key because otherwise the people who try to decipher, who are extremely smart mathematicians, will notice a kind of periodicity and they will be able to decipher it. So the problem boils down to giving to Alice and Bob two identical keys without the spy being able to have a third copy of the two keys. Okay, that's the, uh, the, the challenge. And then quantum mechanics allows you to do that. And if you followed carefully from the beginning, you probably guess that the pair of entangled photons are the solution. So you have a source of pairs of entangled photons. Alice and Bob put the polarizer in the same direction, and then they get either plus one, plus one, or minus one, minus one, well, decide that minus one is zero and that's all. And so they have the random keys. They do something a little smarter, they change orientation, and at the end, they communicate with an open radio saying, on my measurement first, I was like that, and then Bob say, that's good, we can take the data. On the other one, it was like that, okay, we throw it. On the third one, the angle was pi over, uh, over A, ah, let us make a test of Bell's inequality. Okay, and then so they, they do all this game. Where is the interest of non-locality? The interest of non-locality is that if you believe me in what I showed you until the now, the decision to have plus one or minus one only happens at the moment of the measurement, which means that here there is nothing to spy. The key is not yet decided when the photon is passing in front of Eve. So even if Eve is extremely smart, makes a measurement on that photon and send again, the information was not yet there. The information will be there only if he doesn't do anything and then at the last moment it happens. So by just thinking in terms of non-locality, you can immediately see why this scheme, which is due to Arthur Eckert, should be fruitful. Then you do the full calculation, plenty of mathematics and stuff like that, which confirm this intuitive image. Okay, so this is what I say, there is nothing to spile because the key is created at the moment of the measurement. This is used nowadays. You can buy even system of quantum cryptography. And our friend Jain Weipan from China has even shown by, by sending pairs of entangled photons from a satellite, he has shown that you have entanglement surviving at 1,200 kilometers, okay? And so he can do quantum cryptography at such a large distance. Okay, so this really works. Uh, I could also show you, but I will not do it, but if you ask me uh, 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 or privately, I can explain you. Uh, there is something which is called quantum teleportation, which allows you to take a quantum state here and teleport it there. 
And there is a theorem in quantum physics which say when you have a quantum state here, you cannot know the full quantum state if you have a single object. But you can do here, teleport from here and there, provided you erase it from here. This will be extremely useful when we have quantum computer, the output of this computer we can transmit immediately on the other side and it will be gorgeous. But thinking of non-locality, I found, I just give you the result, that here something instantaneously happened, but on the other hand, you need to have a signal coming by a classical channel and so you must put the photon new to on hold in a quantum memory. And so the conclusion of this reasoning about non-locality is that quantum teleportation will be good only when we have good quantum memories. And there is no reason why we should not have good quantum memories. So young people, if you are ambitious, launch a startup to produce quantum memories, provided you have a good idea about quantum memories, of course. But uh, I'm, I'm sure that there is something to do here. So, non-local image suggests the necessity of a quantum memory for new two. By the way, Nicolas Gisin has done something smart. He put the photon on hold on a long coil of optical fiber, which is not the smartest in the world, but at least it works. Okay. So, to finish, do we have a new quantum revolution? Well, what we know is that local realism must be abandoned. So entanglement is at the root of the second quantum revolution. There is another ingredient which was implicit that we have to make explicit. It's not the only ingredient. The other ingredient is the fact that we know how to manipulate, observe, control single quantum objects. Don't believe that this is trivial. When I was a student, nobody had ever done that. And not only nobody had done that, but there were many physicists who thought that it was ridiculous. And among these physicists, the great Erwin Schrödinger. Schrödinger wrote that it is ridiculous to think that we can manipulate a single quantum object, okay? And in 1970, Hans Demelt could trap a single electron and make successive measurements for weeks, maybe months, okay? And uh, so he, he had trapped it here. So there was first trapping of electrons, of atoms, of ions, emission and control of single photons, of pairs of entangled photons. By the way, I did not realize why, why I was doing my experiment. I did not realize explicitly, but I was able to produce and control individual pairs. The entanglement is between the photon and the other one of the same pair. If I could not distinguish between the various pairs, it would have been impossible to observe entanglement. So this a manipulation of single quantum objects is at the key of the quantum technology with entanglement. So there are many different ways, atom, photon, supraconducting uh, uh, devices, etc., etc. Okay, now I ask the question, do we have a quantum revolution? What was the first quantum revolution? It was first conceptual, a new concept, wave-particle duality which gave a scientific revolution because it allowed physicists to understand the structure of matter. Do you, re do you realize that before quantum mechanics, at the end of the 19th century, the physicists who knew plenty of things could not understand why matter was stable because positive and negative charges attract each other. And the matter is full of positive and negative charge. Why does it collapse on itself? It does not collapse on itself because the particles are also waves. But before quantum mechanics, they could not understand. So it was a fantastic conceptual and scientific revolution, and it had revolutionary application. The names are transistor and integrated circuits, laser, that is to say the devices at the root of the information society. You know, the highway of information are based on laser and computers. And you have to realize that these inventions were not made by a young guy in a garage 
in California or in India, Indiana. It was done by the best physicists of that time trying to apply quantum physics to understand how electrons propagate in uh, semiconductors, etc., etc. So you see, for me, the revolution has to be conceptual, scientific, and technological. Can we apply this criteria to the new quantum revolution? Well, we have, of course, the conceptual, that's entanglement. We have the scientific application or the scientific uh, advancement, understanding better entanglement and te technological application. Well, we have. We have quantum communication with cryptography and teleportation. We have quantum computing with two branches, perfect computer that do not exist and they will exist only if quantum error correction is efficient enough. At the time, it's not efficient in the following sense. You know that the idea, I watch my time, it's okay. You know that the idea of, of error correction in ordinary computer is based on redundancy. If you encode the data on three bits rather than one, you make a majority vote, even if one split by error, you still have two. There is something equivalent called quantum error correction, but the price to pay the overhead is very large. You need 10, uh, sorry, you need 1,000 of the best qubit you can make to correct the error. So it means if you want to have a hundred ideal qubit entangle, which is a real goal, which will, would allow you to do plenty of interesting things, you need to have at least a hundred thousand qubit entangle, the best one we can do. Nobody knows how to do that now. So we don't know if a perfect quantum computer will exist or not. Fortunately, there is also imperfect quantum computer, which is called quantum simulator. And with that, already nowadays, you can do calculation which you can, that you cannot do with a classical computer. So we are at the limit of the quantum advantage. Finally, there is quantum metrology is often forgotten. But you know, for instance, this apparatus, which is that bit and weights like 50 kilograms, has been developed by some of my former students. They have developed a startup company and provide this. It's working several, several uh, 24 hours a day, 365 days per year on the Etna volcano. And the idea is that by measuring the fluctuation of gravitation, maybe you can correlate that with the next eruption of the vo volcano. So they measure in a continuous way with an accuracy better than any other system, the small variation of gravity. So it's an example. There are several examples with NV centers, etc. So quantum metrology basically works. Quantum communication works. Cryptography works. Quantum computing perfect does not work well. Uh, I don't resist to tell you the following thing. Until two years ago, I would say that a perfect quantum computer, I will certainly not see it during my life, during my lifetime, okay? Now, I'm not as sure for two reasons. First, we have had tremendous progress on the hardware, on quantum bits, and also on between code the software, that is to say people invent error-correcting code, which are more and more efficient. So maybe we are closer. And on the other hand, we have had fantastic progress in cardiology. And because I have a problem with my heart, thanks to that, I hope to uh, uh, increase my lifetime, OK? And with this, maybe I will see a perfect quantum computer in my lifetime. Let us conclude. Will the new quantum revolution transform our society? What will be the quantum advantage? And I insist on the fact that there are two points of view on the quantum advantage. On the one hand, everybody thinks of that. A quantum computer would be able to make calculations that the classical computer cannot do. 
But there is another point of view, which we have good hope for that. A quantum computer could do the same calculation as a classical computer, but with less energy, with less power, with less electricity. And when young people come and tell me, look, I don't want to do science because science is not good for the planet, I say, hey, come on, work on a quantum computer. You will save energy in the, in the computation centers. Okay, so we don't know yet, but things are open. And hopefully we will have the answer in my lifetime. So nobody can answer with certainty, but many believe in it, so I cite programs in France, in European Union, and everywhere, and each time I go to a different country, I find a national program, so which means that I change my transparencies from one presentation. Last time I was in Switzerland, so I had the Swiss program. Now here I have this program, I hope I select the one. And you also have the companies with big pockets, you know, that uh, they also invest in quantum computation. And we have dozens of startup companies, okay? And uh, we live a fascinating time, okay? And uh, with this, I just want, before finishing, to say that uh, I was lucky when doing my experiments to have two engineers uh, one in optics and micromechanics, another one in electronics. I was lucky in the two last year, in 81 and 82, to have outstanding master students, okay? They were young at that time. And now there are grown-up physicists and people working in AMO physics know that they are stars, Jean Delibar and Philippe Grangier. So, you know, they were gifted. I recognize they were gifted. They were indeed gifted. Uh, of course, the workshop and institute, uh, but with these two, two people, we have been lucky to share the ceremonies in Stockholm uh, two years ago. Thank you very much. transition to an uh, interactive panel discussion where we will have an opportunity to hear more about challenges, opportunities, and the emerging quantum uh, future. I don't know where the, um, the mic is for the questions. There is one over there. <clears throat> Hi, uh, Professor. I, uh, I know that people uh, working in the field theory uh, is working, often works under the assumption of the principle of locality. Uh, does it, um, what does it mean uh, by the implication of the uh, non-locality of the entanglement to, to that area? Or what, do you have any thought on that? Well, I try to tell you. Uh, I do the calculation as everybody else. So you can rely on the calculation that you do based on your course in quantum mechanics. But my point is that for me, quantum non-locality gives me intuitions. Because, you know, you have plenty of equations. Where should you go? What kind of situation should you consider and calculate with your equations? So for me, quantum non-locality is an image that I take more or less seriously. I mean, I don't try to convince you that you should adopt this. I just share with you the idea that at least the world is more complicated than the vision of a local realist vision of Einstein. And accepting non-locality, I have plenty of images allowing me to say, oh, if I do that, there will be this, and it will be interesting for this reason. So that's all I can tell you about non-locality. You don't have to change anything to your equations. You have to change something in your head. But there is another point where you must change in your head. I told you that uh, when I was a student, uh, nobody had yet uh, observed 
and manipulate a single quantum object. It was only large ensemble. You have a vapor of atom, you shine light, you get fluorescent light. And the technique the, for calculating that was always density matrix, because density matrix is about large ensemble. Now that we can calculate about single quantum object, there is another image that you can use. It's called quantum Monte Carlo. You look at the individual as a possible individual evolution by applying a reduction of the wave packet, etc. Okay? And this gives you images. And I can show you, but at the end, if you do things well, you make many individual evolution, you average, and you obtain the same result as this density matrix. But it turns out that here, again, you have the same feature as with non-locality. Sometimes following these images of individual quantum objects give you intuitions that something should be interesting if you do this or that, okay? So my opinion is that we should not refuse these images even if they sound crazy because they allow you to go farther. But once again, what you have learned in quantum physics is okay. Okay, the next one. Um, thank you, Professor Alain, for your talk. Um, I've been lucky to work on quantum teleportation for a little bit. And I remember even... You speak too fast for me. I'm hey, nervous. You know, I'm I've never talked to Nobel laureate I, uh, before. <laughs> I am a foreigner, so please, and I'm just arriving in this country, so please speak slower. Even five years ago, I remember Marlon Scully, the author of the famous I quantum book, yeah, um, telling me that theoretically, all the quantum computation, like principally, all the problems, all the challenges were solved, and it's more up to experiment nowadays to implement it. The quantum teleportation is being implemented mostly in China, and US is trying to catch up. So my question is, what could be the next big leap, big innovation challenge in quantum uh, mechanics? Oh, well, it depends on what you're talking of. In general, in quantum mechanics, well, I can, I can try something. When people try to entangle more and more qubits, it's more and more difficult. It may just be a, qu a, a question of technology. Put better shielding, uh, uh, compensate for fluctuating, uh, I don't know what, uh, field here, etc. But after all, there might be an ultimate fundamental limit. Because you know that there is a fundamental problem. We don't know exactly where is the frontier between the classical macroscopic world and the microscopic quantum world. It may just be a matter of decoherence by fluctuating field, but why not an ultimate limit that would tell you the frontier is here. Beyond that, you enter the macroscopic world. Maybe by doing these experiments, trying to build quantum computer, people will discover that. So if you think of something fundamental, for me, that's the most interesting frontier. How big can we have a real quantum entangled system? Now, there is not only that. When you work on quantum computing, as how I suggested a moment ago, it may well be that we have a big progress to do in applied mathematics. When I was a student, the biggest computer took 24 hours to do a calculation of a Fourier transform with one million points. Nowadays, it's just like that. Why? You are going to tell me because computers are faster. No, the main reason is applied mathematics. People invented the fast Fourier transform algorithm. The time of calculation scales as n log n rather than n square. Take n equal 10 to the 6, n square is 10 to the 12, but n log n is basically 10 to the 6 or 10 to the 7. So you just win a factor of 100,000 maybe one million, just because mathematician invented something. Maybe somebody will invent something very efficient for correcting quantum errors. We don't know. So there is a place where we may have uh, 
impressive progress, but of course the everyday work in all the labs where people try to have better qubit with a slightly better fidelity, etc., is a real challenge. There is another challenge. Can we make qubits by the method, the current method of microelectronics or nanoelectronics? If we could do that, it would be fantastic. You could just go to the clean room and then you build your stuff. So there are plenty. It depends on you. You want my advice? Do the do what you like more. Either going to the lab to improve the qubit, going to apply mathematics in the hope that you will discover something, do what you like. Everything is useful. Hello, Professor. Thank you for the great lecture. I have a couple of questions. One, you talked about creating quantum memories, but I thought the no cloning theorem provides a theoretical <laughs> guarantee. Good question. Don't ask another one. Let me. <laughs> Because I'm old, I cannot remember two questions, okay? So one is enough. Quantum teleportation means I take something here, I put it here, but I erase this one. So it does not violate the no cloning theorem. The, the no cloning theorem says that it is impossible starting from one system to make two systems with exactly the same quantum state. And you know why it is so important, the quantum cloning system? If there was not that the quantum cloning theorem, if it was not that theorem, you could really send information faster than light. Because let's suppose I have my photon with its polarization. I clone, I have two. I clone, I have four. And once I have 20 or 40 photons, with the same polarization, I put one polarizer like that, one like that, one like that, one like that. I do the statistics and I know what was the initial state. And if I know what was the initial state, when Alice changed the orientation, immediately Bob knows. So the no cloning theorem tells you why it's impossible to build a faster than light uh, telegraph. But teleportation is something else. I take the state here, I don't know what the state is, but anyway, I know that I put it here. And if I have the result of a quantum computer in the form of a state, it's good to transfer that state immediately here without passing by some classical measurement and stuff like that. What is the other question? I see. Also, what do you think of the quantum theory of gravity that says oh, that the whole No universe... opinion, no opinion. It's, 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 it's beyond my... Uh, uh, Yes, my understanding of physics. So rather read uh, Roger Penrose or people like that. Okay. Well, Wojciech Zurek has a question. You should invite Wojciech Zurek. And, uh... Thank you very much one more time. Thank you. Thank you.